Okay, so we just finished talking about our biomedical treatment. Now we're gonna move into completely the other side of the coin, and that is our insight therapy. So our biomedical treatment was really about actually reaching in and stimulating our brain or taking medication that would change our brain activity. And insight therapy is more about not touching our bodies, but listening and talking. And so insight therapy, of course, is credited back to Sigmund Freud, who really made it talk therapy. And it's the idea that you just, you listen to what the patient's saying, you listen to what the therapist's saying, you listen, you talk. In the process, you maybe help to identify your thoughts or your emotions. When you talk about your thoughts or your experiences, we might try to reframe and reflect and say, oh, so this is what happened. It's the idea through reframing or reflect, we help people get insight into their feelings or insight into their motivations or insight into their trauma that helps them to validate or feel less pressure or they can move on. Sometimes it's not about validating those symptoms, it's about confronting them and calling them on their cognitive distortions or calling them on their cognitive biases. Sometimes it's about going back into the past and thinking about it. And there's all different types of insight therapy. There's Gestaltian and existential and Adlerian. We're not going to go into all the different types of insight therapy. I do want to give a shout out to Gestaltian therapy though. Um, the thing that I like to mention about that is they're really into role playing. It's the idea that when you go into insight therapy, you sit and you look at an empty chair and you practice talking to the person you have a hard time talking to in real life. You practice those conversations. It's really quite interesting. For the most part, in insight therapy for intro psych, we're gonna focus on two main flavors that are very different from each other. And this is psychoanalysis, more Freudian style, and client-centered, more Carl Rogers style. So for psychoanalysis, the true Freudian approach to talk therapy, what was really going on here is the idea of talking was to get at insight into the unconscious. So Freud believed we had a conscious, pre-conscious, and unconscious, and it was hard for us to tap into our unconscious. He believed that in order to do proper psychoanalysis, you need to have years of training to become a psychoanalyst. And in order to actually tap into a client's unconscious, this needed to be years of treatment. That you just didn't sign up and take one pill for a week. Instead, this was usually an eight to 10 year process where you really get to talk to each other. A lot of the ways you would tap into the unconscious included dream interpretation. This is the idea that the patient would often talk about what they dreamed about and the psychoanalyst would interpret it for them. It's not the patient saying how the dream made them feel. They would talk about the symbols in their dream and the professional health provider would actually interpret the dream for them. Another big approach was free association. So free association is the idea of talking without a filter, even if it's very taboo stuff or very horrible stuff. It was the idea that the psychoanalyst would convince the patient to talk without a filter and not even think about where their thoughts are going. So just start writing or just start talking and whatever pops in your head, you express. If you attempt to filter it or improve or direct where it's going, you were told not to, and you would go back to the start and try again and again. Some of the techniques to help with free association would be things like hypnosis. This is the idea that you would attempt to relax the person, release their inhibitions, so they would feel more comfortable telling you about all the taboo stuff. We also see not Freud use this, but around the same era as when psychoanalysis was big, things like the Rorschach ink block test became very popular. And this was a projection test where you looked at ink blocks on a page and you were told to interpret it. And based on what you interpreted, this might tell what's going on in your unconscious. Now, there was an idea in psychoanalytic thinking that if a patient didn't want to talk about something, if they showed resistance and said, oh, I don't want to talk about that, that's upsetting, or let's not talk about this, this was called resistance. And rather than respecting the ethical boundaries, psychoanalysts were actually trained to push against resistance. Resistance meant that there was something good under there, and we should uncover every little gooey bit of what's going on. This often meant if somebody quit therapy midway through the process that they might have these open wounds that had not healed over and it might just open up lots of things before they can move on. It also meant that sometimes they felt really negative towards their uh, psychoanalyst. They felt really negative towards their care provider. And this was often referred to as transference. If the patient ever was mean or clingy or sarcastic towards the psychoanalyst, they determined that this was some sort of transference, that they were treating them like their mother or treating them like their teacher or treating them like their brother or sister, and that was more the issue. So what I'm saying here is if the patient ever started to be sulky towards the psychoanalyst, they would say, oh, you're sulky towards me because you're usually sulky towards your mother. You're transferring your feelings of your mother onto me. 
and they believed it was good to push and push and push beyond these boundaries and make them talk about everything because then we could get at catharsis. And catharsis was supposed to be that major point of insight therapy where you're like, aha, I understand why I have this obsession with this. It's because this thing happened to me in my childhood long ago and I haven't let it go. And then once you realize that, maybe you can let it go and move on. So that was catharsis, kind of unlocking these earlier memories and understanding it. Of course, the psychoanalytic approach was known for improving lots of people's lives because there was a lot of people walking around that couldn't talk about this taboo stuff. And that's why it became popular. But at the same time, it had a lot of problems. There was a lot of criticism that perhaps because the psychoanalyst was interpreting everything, maybe they were putting thoughts in. Maybe they were suggesting new memories into the patient, especially repressed memories of trauma that didn't actually exist. Perhaps there was just a little bit too much speaking for them and interpreting for them and seeing things in there that weren't actually there. And it really didn't give the patient a voice. They really had to submit to the healthcare professional. This is extremely opposite to the next approach we're gonna talk, which is still an insight therapy, but rather than calling them patients, we tend to call them clients. And this is Rogerian, Carl Rogers therapy. It's known sometimes as non-directive therapy, person-centered therapy, or client-centered therapy. Also sometimes called humanistic therapy. And this is completely different than psychoanalysts. So what happens in client-centered therapy? You really treat the client like a whole person who's not a subordinate of the therapist. Instead, you see them as able to solve their own problems if they just believe in themselves. The big goal of client-centered therapy is self-acceptance and self-actualization. So Carl Rogers believed that the goal of this therapy was to be extremely person-centered. You focus wholly on the client. When they are there, you give them your undivided attention. So the therapist isn't just scribbling and saying, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. They're making eye contact, they're focusing, they're smiling, and you're very genuine, not fakely looking at them or fakely smiling. You're genuinely in touch with them and giving them your undivided attention. In addition to undivided attention, you give them unconditional positive regard. This means that no matter what they say, you don't judge them. Even if they're a serial killer, that's not your role to judge them. You are there to help them. And so the courts and the juries can take care of that. That's not your job. And so it's the idea if somebody's talking about an addiction or if they cheated on their spouse or, you know, if they did something very socially faux pas, you don't judge them on that. You're just there to help them as who they are. And so you show them a large degree of empathy and a large degree of authenticity. So you really let them know that you think they're capable of being a good person and you want to know where they're coming from. A big part about this is non-directed reflection. And so this is the idea that no matter what the patient says, you don't give them advice. If they ask you explicitly for advice, you say, well, what do you think? And so this is the idea that you go in and you give them a couple different possibilities of responses. You can parrot back exactly what they said. You can paraphrase what they said. You can summarize what they said, or you can just go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so this is the idea of using active listening and support to just validate someone's experiences. This has been shown to be very effective in well-trained individuals. Carl Rogers has been known for doing excellent therapy, even with people with extreme mental health conditions. Someone who's on the brink of hurting themselves, for instance, he would validate and make them feel important. He's not necessarily encouraging them to hurt themselves, but he's listening to them wholly. And he believed in this situation, everyone will have the power to make the right choice for them. If only they feel supported, they'll be able to make the right choice. And so this is where Rogers was really going with it. Again, this peaked around the 1960s. And since then, most of the principles of Rogerian therapy has been adopted into other schools of thought. So a lot of the time when you go and you receive therapy from a cognitive behavioral psychologist or a dialectical psychologist, you are getting client-centered packaged with other things. Some of the criticisms of client-centered therapy is because it's non-directed and somebody generally hasn't learned the coping strategies or actually needs advice, it's not being given to them. And so the other schools of therapy believe sometimes, sometimes we need to teach them things or sometimes we need to call them out on their cognitive distortions and that's not happening here. And so that's some of the criticisms of client-centered therapy. But that being said, client-centered therapy has been embedded in almost all other types of therapy moving forward.